of all the things that were said and all those songs, all those lyrics that we just sang to heaven, one stands out to me the most, and that is about the grave. That the grave has no claim on me. And loved ones, if you've embraced Christ as your Lord and Savior, the grave has no claim on you either. And in our crazy times here in our world right now, that's something that not everybody can say. But loved ones, we have the opportunity to not just say that truth, but to live it out in front of a world that is scared to death. The truth is, is that because of Jesus, though we die, we live. And Lord, we're thankful for that. That is the amazing gift that you've given us. And so, part of my sniffles. Lord, that's a gift that we don't deserve, but it's a gift that you've given. And Lord, we want to live in that freedom today. Live in the freedom that even though we may die, we live forever. So we thank you for that reality, Lord. And I pray that you would let that get down into every bit of who we are. I pray, Lord, that you would speak to us now through your word. I have been praying all morning and here again, Lord, I just want to preach in a way that is worthy of who you are. So please help me. For some reason, Lord, I feel like today is, I don't know, maybe, Maybe I'm wrong, but I feel like today is like the most important day I've ever stood behind a pulpit. So with that weight, Lord, I'm asking for your help so people could hear you. They don't need to hear me. I got nothing to say. Nothing of value, Lord, except which comes from you. <clears throat> so please direct me as I go. And give everyone here and those that are online watching, give them ears to hear what you are saying to them, that we might obey you and advance your kingdom. In Jesus' name, amen. So, loved ones, for the tough ones that actually made it out. Yeah. You know that? Part of my prayer where I said, don't, I got nothing to say. Oh, I got so much to say. But I don't want to say it. Nah. You know, you're not supposed to judge another one's servant, and I'm not going to say anything. I can only speak for our church. We're here. We're open. He said, gather we are. That's what we're doing. Okay? And so uh, that's what we're doing here this morning. Um, don't want to get political either, but, you know, um, as many of you probably know, if not all, our president, whether you like him or not, um, he's declared that today would be a, a national day of prayer. So I think that's good, you know. Again, whether you like him or not, you know, prayer's good, right? Whether he's praying or not, I don't know, but he said that we should. So I think that we should uh, spend a few moments, and in light of all this craziness that's going on in our world, I think that we should. Uh, pray and pray for him and all those that are in authority that God has placed over us. You know, and the Bible tells us in Rome, in the book of Romans, I think it's chapter 13, that even the authority that you don't like, God ordained. So we have to submit to it, okay? And we're supposed to pray for them. That's what it says in the scriptures. And so we should do that. Before we do that, I just want to do a little um, housekeeping, just so you'll know, uh, we, we shall not fear some foolish virus, Okay. But we're also not stupid, so, you know, we've got some Lysol disinfectant, and we sprayed down and wiped down the pew tops and the tables and the armchairs and, and the handles and, you know, all that kind of good stuff. And uh, there's hand sanitizers by the door, and there's sanitizing wipes by the bathrooms. You see it there on the barrel by the bathroom. So, like, let's be smart, okay? Um, I know everyone in here is in their 20s. But this virus likes, it just has a thing for older folks. So, you know, let's not go slobbering all over each other today if we're senior citizen. Let's just, we'll skip our little meet and greet. Hey, everyone. 
okay? Don't go coughing in my face or nothing, okay? Um, but we're not going to fear. And, and as a matter of fact, if, uh, if anyone's sick, you feeling it? You know, the Bible says that we're not supposed to close the church. I'm supposed to call upon the elders of the church for a prayer and, and to anoint you with oil and to pray for you and that God would heal in that environment right there. That's the context he does his greatest healing work. So if you're sick, don't run out of here. You know, Herb and I are sitting right here. I got oil right here in my pocket for just that, right here. So if you, wanna, if you want someone to pray for you, you know, when we're done, you know, Herb and I will be, we'll, we'll just kind of hang out over here and we'll, we'll pray for you. All right? So we're not afraid, right? We're not afraid? Say we're not afraid. Awesome. Well, let's pray. Let's pray. Just um, take some time and, and uh, Holy Spirit of God, you said that you'd, you'd, you'd teach us how to pray. And so as I often uh, say, I don't, know, I don't know what to pray. You know, I, I'm just a regular dude, and I, I know that um, some people seem to just be tuned into you in prayer, and you could s- and listen to them all day. Um, I don't know that I'm that uh, pretty of a prayer. I just know that it's good to talk to you. I know that you want us to, and um, you said we should pray about everything, pray for all people, and pray without ceasing. That's a lot of prayer, and that this would be a house of prayer. And so we want to do just that, Lord, before we dive into your word. Um, we just want to spend a few moments uh, talking to you, listening to you. We come together this morning uh, in unity, as one voice in unity with the rest of the believers across our great nation. We're coming to you to, this morning to, to, to say lots of things, but from this outcropping of your kingdom right here at Revolution Church, the first thing we want to say is that you are good. And, and we trust you, Lord. And, and Lord, in the face of adversity, we can remember back to your word that gives us patience and encouragement. And it tells us that in this life we will have trouble. But to be of good cheer, for you have overcome the world. And so, Lord, we, being in you, we... We have overcome even this chaos that is in our world right now. We, we can overcome that. We might, not, we might not avoid it, but we can, we can get up over that thing and not let it get to us and bring us down to the ground. And so we're very grateful, Lord, for that truth, that reality. Lord, there's so many people just here in the United States of America, Lord, that don't have that that we just said. They don't have the ability to be an overcomer the way we are. And so today we lift up those people. We lift up the people that, that not only don't know you at all and have even maybe never heard of you or maybe um, have denied you flat out or for those that have said yes, but yet they are not overcoming. They have fear in their heart, Lord. You, your word says that your perfect love expels all fear. So, Lord, we pray that your perfect love, the love of Jesus Christ on the cross, that that love would pierce the bullseye of the heart of every person in this country that has declared openly that you are their Lord and Savior, but yet they live in fear. Expel the fear and replace it with your love that they may be strong soldiers for Christ. Lord, we lift up our president to you and our vice president and all those in his administration and all those in the Senate and the House of Representatives and all those that you've placed in authority, whether we like them or not, means nothing right now. You've put them there We submit to your authority as we lift them up in prayer. We ask, Lord, that you would guide them in the decisions that they make. Help those that are within that executive, legislative, and judicial branches. All those three branches. All those that are Christ followers, Lord. Let them be bold. (laughs) Strengthen their, 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 their spirit today that they might speak boldly representing you. Let them hear your voice. Let them follow your voice. Your word says that my sheep hear, my lambs hear my voice, and they follow me. Let it be said of our Christians in authority that they hear your voice and follow you today more than ever. Our country needs calm. They need 
the calming effect of your Holy Spirit upon us. And so we ask that you would do a great work here in our country. Lord, we lift up our whole nation to you. You said that if my people who are called by my name, Christ, if my Christians will humble themselves and pray, that you will hear us from heaven and you will heal our land. And Lord, so we lift up our voice in unity with all other Christian voices that are coming out of churches all over this nation right now, whether they're in the building or they're home on their live broadcast, whatever they're doing, Lord, wherever they are, let our voice join theirs in unity, together, touching together here on earth on this matter that we need your healing to go across our land and to fix all these crazy problems that are here. We pray, Lord, against, and in the name of Jesus, we pray against this disease, this virus, so that it would protect us right here. That those of us that have chosen to come into your house, to sing your praises, to hear your word, to, to pray to you, Lord, that they would be, they'd be walking out of here clean that no weapon formed against us would prosper. That m The truth is that many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers us from them all. So let it be said today, Lord, as we call upon your name, that you'd hear us from heaven and you'd deliver us from all of our afflictions. We trust you, God, and we love you. Speak to us now through your incredible word that is true and powerful and sweeter, even sweeter than the sweetest honeycomb. Lead us in the way that we should go, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right. So I, uh, all week, you know, I, I work on this message and I'm trying to figure out, you know what the hardest part is? The intro. The intro is the hardest part. How to start this thing out, right? So how does it, what's the best way to start out a message from Jesus about his kingdom? Well, I think the best place would be where he started out. Right after his baptism into the wilderness, 40 days, comes back, starts his ministry. First thing he did was began preaching Repent of your sin, turn to God, for the kingdom of heaven is near. That's a good way to start, right? And then he goes on and he starts talking about this, uh, this prayer that we're supposed to pray. And really it's about voicing the desire that he wants us to have, which is let your kingdom come, let your will be done here on earth. Let's just get it more personal. Here at Revolution, get it a little closer to home. Here at your house, how about even closer? Point to where it needs to go. Right there, right? Let your will be done here in my life as it is in heaven, right? And so uh, he's preaching about a kingdom. And he tells us in his great commission that all authority in heaven and earth is his. That he is the king of said kingdom. He's the king. And that's why when you see at the very end of the Bible, in Revelation chapter 19, that when it all comes down and he separates those that are in and those that are out and the angels go before him to do that separation, he comes down on a horse and on his thigh, I don't know if it's on his thigh or on the robe that's laying over his thigh, the tattoo people love to say it's a tattoo, but I don't know where it says it because different translations say different things. But right over here, it says, King of kings and Lord of lords, right? That's who Jesus is. He, he didn't come to, to set up a religion. He didn't come to just set up like a, a church, although he says, I'm going to build my church. But what he came to set up was a kingdom to announce and establish a kingdom where there is one sovereign monarch who rules supreme, him and him alone. 
That's what he came to set up, okay? That's a kingdom, and that's hard for us to live in because we're not used to that. But we've been talking about the last couple of weeks, and hopefully it's starting to settle into you, and you're starting to bend the knee a little bit more to, to the kingship of Jesus Christ. You know, you can't read the Bible that is his book and ignore the fact that he is the king of the kingdom. You can't ignore the fact that time and time again in the Gospels, over and over and over again, he's talking about a kingdom, right? He's not talking about a church. He's not talking about a religion. He's talking about a kingdom. He is the king of kings. And, and, and so listen, when he comes back to set up his full kingdom, right, with the king of kings and lord of lords on his leg, that's different than the kingdom now. See, we talked about this last week before I have a terrible memory. So just we talked about how the kingdom is now and not yet. Was that last week? I don't even know. But that means that right now, wherever Jesus reigns, there his kingdom is. So if he reigns in your life, you're kingdom territory, right? So a kingdom is, 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 a, is a territory or a group of people that are ruled by one sovereign. And, and hopefully you're one of those people, but eventually it turns into a territory as well. Because when it all comes down and he comes and splits the sky and sets up his full kingdom here, those that are not part of the kingdom, they go bye-bye. And it's only going to be those that bowed the knee to the king that get to be there with him. Okay, that's the not yet, and that's coming, okay? But that was a weird one, like it's now and it's not yet, like that's weird. Here's another one that's weird. That's what, that's what this week is for, more weird stuff at your church. The kingdom is small and big. The kingdom is small and big. So I'm going to explain all that over the next 30 minutes. <clears throat> I did a lot of studying this week of some kind of strange things, just like learning some stuff. I think this whole corona thing is, is the, the motivator. But let me start here. Did, did you know that the average lifespan for a man in America is 73, right? And then the ladies, 80. <laughs> Guys, I want to do this for you. I'm not going to. Because my wife's not in the room, so I don't get the full effect. If I say it's because you got girls drive us crazy and we don't last as long, she's not going to be here to hear it. So I'm not going to. All right, listen. When you average the two together, though, all kidding aside, when you average the two together, we, are, we live about 76. That's the average. Like some will, will go before that, some will go after that. But 76 years is about the average, okay? Do you know, what, you know how many days that is? If you've done any math, here's some quick math for you. 76 years is 27,740 days. Yeah, right? Do you know what that means? That means that you had a lot of stuff happen in your life. A lot of stuff happened in your life. Just think about the, all the experiences that you've had, the people you've run into contact with, the places you've been, the input into your, like, hard drive has been off the charts, right? Imagine all the things you've seen and heard that have in some way shaped who you are today. Some of them are, like, profound, like they've profoundly affected you, big time, right? And then some of the things, they're so minute that you don't even remember them even right now when we're talking about it. I understand all that. But think about that. Think about, like, when you went to school, right? The curriculum that they taught you, the teachers that you had, whether they were good or bad. Some of us look back and we had really bad experiences with teachers. Some of them look back and there was that one teacher that just poured right into your life, right? And you just loved that teacher. The bullies, the boyfriends, the girlfriends, the fights, the gossip, the cliques, all of it. Your parents, some of us had great parents, some of us had horrible parents, but they had habits, they had different ways about them, right? Everyone has their little family things that they got, right? They're, the way, it's my parents did it. Good, bad, I don't know, but just our little ways, our friends, some of them great, some of them have backstabbed us, some of them have walked away, some of us have been let down, we've let them down, some of us have friends that 
are still with us. I'm 50 years old now, almost 51. I still got some buddies from high school that still call me, still Facebook. I can call them anytime. Some of them are good, some of them are not. Think about the TV shows that you've ingested over the years, time and time again, hours and hours at a time, filling up your mind, things you've seen, things you've heard, the movies you've watched, the books that you've read, all of life's experiences, good and bad, divorces, abuse. Some of us have had great jobs with great bosses, right? And some of us have had horrible jobs with a, just a horrible boss. You don't even know what planet they came from. The loss of loved ones, the pain that goes with that and the longing to see them again and wishing that you had one more minute with them. The impact our culture has had on us, not just as Americans, but here in America we have different pockets and areas, right? Growing up here is a lot different than in New York or Boston. It's way different. And each of those little areas have their own little ways of life and biases and prejudices, and all of those experiences, if you only had one a day, that's enough to blow your mind. Think about it right now. 27,000 things to process right now. (sighs) Right? But here's the thing. It's not a one a day thing, is it? Just think about that. All those things on the list. 10, 20, 30, 100, 500, thousands every day. Boom, 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 shaping who you are and what you do right now. And in the midst of all of that, all of that input, all of that data entry into your hard drive, someone faithful to the great commission of Jesus Christ opens their mouth and shares the gospel with you. Maybe it was a, friend at a lunch break at school or at work. Maybe it was a faithful or loving grandma or grandpa. Or maybe it was a preacher. I don't know. But one of them looked you in the eye and told you about your failure and told you what it was, and that was sin. And he told you about God's wrath and his judgment and punishment for this sin. The wages of sin is death, the Bible says. But he also told you about God's love, John 3, 16, right? For God so loved the world that he gave his only son. So whoever would believe in him would not perish, would not absorb that wrath, but have everlasting life. And not only is that something that's said and that's a reality, but the Bible also says that God showed you his great love by sending his son to die for you while you were a sinner. You didn't have to get cleaned up first. You are rotten, wretched, and horrible in every way. And God still says, I love you so much, I'm going to give myself to die in your place. That's crazy. And so you were taught that all these things, and if you would repent of your sin and turn to God, that he would save you. And Paul said of this gospel, he said that it's the power of God at work saving all who believe. And Jesus says that this one bit of data that gets into your hard drive, that can change everything. Everything about you. I want you to see what he says about it. And uh, grab a copy of God's word. You have a Bible with you? All right. Grab your Bible and open it up to Matthew chapter 13. I have a lot to say today. I got pages of stuff, so we're going to just settle in, buckle up, and hold on. Matthew 13, look at verses 31, 32, and 33. Jesus says that this one thing has massive effects in two ways. You ready? Are you there? You there? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. 31. Here's another illustration Jesus used. It's a parable, right? The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed 
planted in a field. It is the smallest of all seeds. It's like a pinhead, y'all. You ever see a mustard seed? Literally, it's a pinhead. Like the little ball at the top of a sewing pin. You know what I'm talking about? Like, you know what I mean? A little dot. That's a, that's a mustard seed. It's teeny. He says, like a mustard seed planted in a field. I just get that picture right now. Just imagine that for a second. Think of the dot. That's a mustard seed, right? And think of a field. See the difference between the two? The field is kind of like that 27,740 things that you live those days. And then all the things that you live all those days. That's the field. See how big it is? And in the middle of all that acreage, dot. That's the kingdom of heaven. It's the smallest of all seeds, but it becomes the largest garden plant. It grows into a tree and birds come and make nests in its branches. Jesus also used this illustration. The kingdom of heaven is like the yeast. You know what yeast is? I'll talk about that in a moment. It's the yeast a woman used in making bread. Even though she put only a little bit, this much, look, right here, a little bit, right, a little bit. Even though she put only a little yeast, in three measures, see the dot and the field? You see it there again, right? One little bit of yeast in three measures of flour, yet it permeated every part of the dough. So, so Jesus says that this one bit of data, the kingdom of heaven, the gospel, Jesus himself, right? When that data gets in, it changes everything in two massive ways. I'm going to flip it here real quick and just say, first, yeast. Yeast is talking about how it gets inside and permeates all of the loaf of bread, right? The whole thing. So yeast is how the kingdom impacts you, right? Internally, how it changes you. And seed is how it impacts yours, your family, your neighbors, your coworkers, your friends, your city, right? So, let's talk about how the kingdom first impacts you because you can't in impact anything until it's impacted you, right? So, you know what yeast is? I did a little research on yeast. You know what yeast is? Fungus. Yeah, it's a fungus. That's gross, right? Some people eat fungus. For all you mushroom people, you're kind of weird. Don't raise your hand, right? That's gross. It's disgusting. Well, since you're going there, I'm not talking about those kind of mushrooms, Rich, okay? <laughs> We're all being sanctified. I'm still at work. We need an edit button on this Facebook thing. <clears throat> so here's the thing with, with this yeast, right? It's a fungus. And what you do is you put it, you add a little bit, just a little bit. It's all you need is a little bit. And you add it to, to flour and water. And it starts to grab hold of starches and it turns them into sugars. And then as the chemical reaction continues, carbon dioxide and ethyl alcohol are formed, which causes there to be air bubbles. And those air bubbles start to spread throughout all of the flour and water, and they spread throughout the whole thing, and those air bubbles start to grow, and you see what happens to a loaf of bread, right? Right? Do you ever see it just like one little piece come out? No, it's, it goes through the whole thing. And the whole thing rises and expands, okay? <clears throat> and when the gospel is ingested, I love how Jesus uses this, because when the gospel is ingested and the Holy Spirit moves in, it begins to change who you are and how you think and how you talk and what you do. 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, If anyone is in Christ, they're a new creation. The old has died Behold the new man. So the question is, what can the gospel, what can the kingdom, the gospel of the kingdom, when that gets into you, what can that change in you? Well, I have just a couple things. I would say, first and foremost, it can change how you view other people and how you treat them. And we need that. Maybe, maybe this is on the top of my list because I need it more than you. I don't doubt that at all. 
But I know that because of the gospel, it changes the way you view other people and how you treat them because it gives you a right view of yourself. See, some people say that you didn't bring anything to the cross and Jesus gave you everything. And I don't think that's true at all. I think you brought failure. I think you brought fault, right? That's what you brought. And then in exchange for that, he gave you freedom and faith and forever. That's the exchange at the cross. And and when you understand that you brought nothing except failure and flaw, and you bring all that, but yet he gives you what he gives you. When you realize that you are nothing, it helps you to look differently at other people and treat them different because you don't deserve to be treated well either. And that's what the gospel does. It, 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 it happily humbles you and makes you realize that you're not worthy of anyone being nice to you either. And so it helps us be nice to them. And so how does this flesh out? Well, because he's exchanged my failure, flaw, and fault for faith, freedom, and forever, then I know that he doesn't hold a grudge against me. Right? If he's forgiven me, it's done. And so I, since, since God doesn't hold a grudge on me, then I'm not going to hold a grudge against you. And you're not going to hold a grudge against me anymore. Amen. Right? We release all of that. That's what the kingdom of heaven does. We also understand because of this idea of bringing failure, flaw, and fault to the cross, that we cannot earn God's love. He gave us the freedom and the faith and the forever, not because we brought him a good gift. We brought him, pardon me, crap, right? And he gave you all this awesome stuff. Why? Because before you brought him your failure, he chose to love you. That's why. He chose to love you because he chose to love you. You can do the same. You can love other people as well. You don't have to earn my love. I shouldn't have to earn your love, but that's why the Bible says that his ways are not our ways, his thoughts are not our thoughts, because that's not the way we live. We live by, if you're nice to me, then I'll be nice to you. You tick me off one time, we are done, right? There's no forgiveness. The Bible says we should, how are we going to get together? How are we going to put all these people in one room and get along? By, by, by allowing for a, for a um, what's the word? An allowance for, 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 for sin. An allowance for fault. An allowance for fault. Listen, bro, I'm going to let you screw up in my life. I don't care if you crap on me. I'm going to let you do it in advance. Freedom, right? Then I just let him go. He doesn't have to tiptoe around me. He doesn't have to walk on eggshells anymore around me. Make sure you do everything right or else you're going to tick Moses off. Who put that chair there? <laughs> don't mess with me that way. It's got to be balanced. <clears throat> you don't have to tiptoe around me. I want to give an allowance for fault, right? You don't need to earn my affections. I also understand that the gospel teaches me because of what I brought versus what he gave me on his own that Jesus put my comfort above his own on the cross. And so I'm going to have the same attitude with others. My wife and I have a line at home. It's frustrating like crazy, but it's a gospel statement, and it's a good statement, and I need to learn to not say it and live it, but embrace it and love it and get in there. And it's our life is not our own. Our life is not our own. So when you're the pastor of a church, like, it's a good, I love my job, man. It's a good job. I hate to even call it a job. It's a good job, though. <clears throat> But man, it's, you know, like I was getting ready to leave yesterday. It's been a long day. Getting ready to take off on a road trip to, to Greenville as soon as we say amen. Had a long drive. Been up since 4.30. <clears throat> I'm tired. But when I was leaving here last night, some dude, homeless guy, he finally got a job. Praise the Lord. Construction. Called me up. He's a three-hour bike ride away from here. Please, Moses, I need a hard hat and a uh, construction, you know, one of the things you, you wear, the vest. Can you please? <laughs> yes. 
I would be happy to. So I go to Home Depot and I get it and I drive. So he doesn't have to pedal, you know. I drive all the way out to Apopka, back roads where he's sitting on the side of the road on a bike. But Monday morning he's going to be digging ditches over by the airport for 11 bucks an hour. It's awesome. It's awesome, right? So, so our life is not our own. And Jesus put my comfort above his own on the cross. So that's the way we are to view other people. We're supposed to have the same attitude as Christ, considering others as more important than ourselves. And since God showed his love, so will I. And why will I show my love? Because what they do is horrible, but who they are is valuable. That's why. And so, don't you see your value in what Christ endured for you? Don't, don't you see your value in what he endured? See, the Bible says that for the joy set before him, he endured the cross. The cross, right? The cross. He endured the cross, disregarding its shame. You know what that means? I'm whipped, I'm beaten, I'm spit on, I'm murdered, I don't deserve it. You know what disregard means? No big deal. It's no big deal. Why? For you. That's why. He didn't even care. It's no big deal. Right? He endured the cross. Right? Don't we all, even us that, are, that sin, don't we have this attitude that we're willing to pay more for something that we think is, is precious and important? We'll pay more for it. So your value is displayed by the price that he paid. You see? That, that's who you are. He endured the, he didn't, he didn't pay a little extra at Walmart for you. He endured the cross for you. That's a value statement, not just of who he is, but who you are to him. He was willing to pay that price for you because you are precious, because you are important. Yes. Praise him. So we're talking about the inner change. What can, what can the gospel, what can the kingdom do inside of us? Well, this inner change, this God kingdom in us, if the kingdom of heaven is our focus, it becomes, it, it starts to permeate everything that we are, like the yeast inside of a loaf of bread, then it changes our schedule. And it changes our wallet. And it changes your words. And it changes your work, your attitude at work. Remember what Pastor John said. God, God's eternal work is the internal building of Christ's character in you. Amen. That's what he's doing. That's why you're here. Because he wants to change who you are on the inside. You know, I learned more about yeast. This starch that it grabs a hold of and changes, do you know starch in of itself is odorless and tasteless? And yeast grabs it and turns it into sugar, right? And this is what Jesus does to us. He gets all up in you, right? And he starts, he starts making you into something way different and something that's good. You know, the Bible tells us, these are, some, these are direct quotes from the scripture, that you were born dead to God, that you are far from God, and that you are an enemy of God. But when Jesus gets all up in you, right, now you're a son of God, you're a daughter of God, you're a friend of God, you're a priest of God, you're the righteousness of God. That's who you are, right? The kingdom is like yeast, changing the odorless tasteless nothing into something sweet. That's what he does to us, okay? That's the kingdom is like yeast, changing you. Well, the kingdom is also like a seed, right? Changing yours, your family, your coworkers, your neighbor, your street, your city, your world, right? The gospel, this one bit of data, can change you into a life-giving person to other people. 
Go, go back to um, Matthew 13 and, and look at the first story there. We talked about yeast already, how it permeates every part of who you are and changes you completely. But now look at the seed. The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed. That's small, right? Planted in a field. That's big. It is the smallest of all seeds, but it becomes the largest of garden plants. Visualize it, loved ones. You see it? It grows into a tree, and birds come and make nests in its branches. So once again, in this parable, like both of them, Jesus stresses the size of the seed and then what it could do. Just like he stressed the amount of yeast being little, but what it would do. Big results for both. Just this one thing, Jesus believed, received, and living inside of you can be so transformational that you become a life-giving source to others. Right? Listen, the smallest seed becomes the biggest tree, and the birds come and put their nest. That's their home. Think about your home. What does your home, what is it supposed to represent, right? It represents a place where you can go to to have family. Like, this is ideal. I know some families are dysfunctional, but isn't the home the place where you can go and have family, relationship that is life-giving? Isn't it a place of provision? Isn't that where you go to eat? Right? You go there and you have and you have food, provision. All that you would need is there at home. Protection from the elements, protection from bad things. The place where you go to learn, right? Isn't that the place where mom and dad are supposed to teach their kids how to live? A place of love. You just want, I just want to go home, right? I just want my blankie. I just want my mommy. These are all expressions that we all use because there's something about home that is comforting and life-giving to us. We all want to go home. It's a place where we're supposed to find peace. This is what God wants you to be to others. He's using this story here, but you can see it. It's this little thing. It's the gospel that gets inside of you, and you become a tree where others can come and put and find home. And all that that encompasses, peace and love and provision and learning and family and relationships and safety, All of those things. He wants that to be what you are to other people. That's what he wants. Hebrews 12, 15 says this. Look after each other so that none of you fails to receive the grace of God. See, it's not often that manna just falls out of heaven. Most of the time when manna falls out of heaven, when you're in that place where, man, I just need you to come through for me, God, please. And you're like pleading with him. You're on your knees and you're praying. You need help. Usually the manna from heaven comes right out of somebody else, right? When someone needs something, you need your rent paid, gas for your car, food, right? How often are you outside when you pray for food and, and, and Chef Boyardee falls out of the sky? Could it happen? Please say yes. But most often, what happens? Someone comes along, right? God sends his blessing, right? That's why he says, pay attention so that no one ever fails to receive the grace of God. My grace is coming, and it's coming through you, right? It's coming through you. And so that's why the scriptures are just filled with time after time. Give generously, serve tirelessly. Why? Because we have to pay attention. Because the grace of God could be missed by someone if we're not doing that. That's why it's all throughout the Bible. <clears throat> so we have to look after each other. Do you see the, do you see the picture? Like when you, hear, when you read this story of the, of the seed in the, in the garden, in the field, and how it grows from this little plant up to a big plant, and then it's a big tree, and you see the nests and the birds. Do you visualize that? You need to visualize that. That tree, that's you. That's you. That's what God wants you to be, a life-giving source to the people that are around you. 1 Corinthians 15.45 says that Christ is a life-giving spirit. And right, so, so listen, loved ones, Christ in you 
can make you a life-giving spirit, right? But listen, you have to follow the promptings of his spirit. You have to follow the promptings of his word that the spirit inspired. You have to follow what he says to do so he can use you as the tree where others can bring their nests and find provision and protection and love and peace. You have to follow him. You have to do as he says to do, okay? There are some that would argue that when you get saved, this is going to happen automatically. I'm not that guy. I'm not of that camp. I am of the persuasion that his spirit is now in you, and he gives you prompts, and he gives you his word, and you must follow him, right? You won't do it automatically, because otherwise the Bible would never say, don't grieve the Holy Spirit. It doesn't say don't grieve the Holy Spirit because we can't. Don't grieve the Holy Spirit because we can. It's when he says go do something. I want you to be a life-giving source to these people and you choose not to, then you won't be. He won't make you be nice to someone. You have to choose this. So let's give you some proper theology on being a life-giver. Paul says in his letter to the Christians in Ephesus, this is what he says, Now all glory to God, who is able through his mighty power at work within us. What's the mighty power? We talked about that, Romans 1.16. What was it? The mighty power is the gospel, right? What was the mighty power of God at work? It says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. It is the power of God at work, saving everyone who believes. So when the gospel gets inside of you, right, now all glory to God who is able through his mighty power at work within us, the gospel and his spirit, because you get both. Then he can accomplish infinitely, someone say infinitely, infinitely more than we could ask or think, infinitely more, infinitely more infinitely more, like not just a little bit more, much more. What is it? Infinitely more, right? Tons more, way more than you could ever ask or think. (coughs) What could God do in and through you if your heart was humble and your mind was open and your will was submissive to the gospel of Christ and the influence of his spirit? What infinitely, it's like way big, tons of stuff, right? He could do so much. But if you're like me, you start wondering, like, I'm not much of anything. What could he do through me? I live in this little house with this little junky car, with this little junky job, and I don't have much money in the bank, and I didn't have much of an education. I'm kind of a failure in this, 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 and you start reading it off, right? Anybody there? I'm there all the time. <clears throat> and if you feel that way, you get it. That's good. That's good. Go back to the text, right? What I just said. Now, all glory to who? To God, who is able. See, God is able through his mighty power at work within you. So let's just take apart the, the, the verse. Take out the stuff between the commas, right? Now, all glory to God who is able to accomplish more than we could ask or think, right? God is able. God's the one who accomplishes it. And that's all you need to do is listen, obey, and be fascinated. That's what you need to do. Can Moses open up a a, a sea? No, (laughs) right? Could, could, Could Joshua make the sun stand still? Could, could, how many people in here could scream at that wall and make it fall down? No one can. God did it through them. Right? They're nothing. Listen, I I I know exactly what this this the scripture verse means. Because I can admit to you that I am nothing. I am nothing. I as I'm sitting here talking to you, I don't feel as though I even deserve to be talking to you, that all eyes should not be on me, because I am nothing. But I know what this verse means because I get it. He can't do, I can't do anything for God. Nothing. But by his mighty power at work in me, he can do infinitely more than I could ever ask or think. How many people do you think, reasonably, you guys don't know John. I'm going to pick on you, John. How many people 
reasonably, just based on who you are and what you think, how many people do you think in your lifetime you, you're going to be able to share the gospel with and maybe they come to the Lord? Huh? Just pick a number. I mean, you could be arrogant, you could be humble, you do whatever you want. Just pick a number. Just pick a number. Throw one out there. Zero to a million. Okay, that's a lot, right? Anybody else want to throw a number out there? Aiden? How many? Just give me a number. Five to ten? Anybody else? A thousand, thousands? Okay. So I used to sell porn, and I used to sell drugs, and I used to manufacture those mushrooms that we were talking about, and my bedroom was filled with dehydrators. That's, what, that's me. I was addicted to porn. I sold porn. I did drugs. I drank every night. I was a disgusting. I was the guy, your daughter, if you go near that man, I'll kill you. That was me, okay? So you can understand that all that with the fact that I barely graduated high school. I, I missed both high school um, rehearsal, you know, the graduation rehearsals because I was so wasted. I was passed out in my driveway. I missed both. This is who your pastor is, okay? But listen, through the help of of my friend Bobby, who's not here with us this morning. I wish he was. <clears throat> but I'm telling you, I know what this verse means. All glory to God, through his mighty power at work within me, he can do infinitely more than we could ask or think, okay? So you guys, put up this picture, okay? In 2010, my buddy Bobby thought of a billboard for this church to launch this church, and it was that, Okay? And, and he was too shy to get in front of a camera, and I was the pastor, so I had the camera stuffed in my face. And out of that interview right there, I personally, a nothing, got to share these words. No matter who you are, no matter what you've done, if you'll turn from that sin and turn to Jesus, he'll forgive you forever. I got to share those words at, on that interview with 250 million people. Yeah. It was on CNN Worldwide. It was on Fox News Nationwide. It was in the tabloids like the Inquirer. It was, in, it was in every country in the world. I was on radio shows, TV, everything. I'm a nothing. I'm a zero. 250 million people saw my face and heard those words out of my mouth. How does that happen? All glory to God who is able to do infinitely more than we could ever ask or think by his mighty power at work in us. You have to just listen. He said, tell everyone about me, and I did. That's it. That's all you got to do. And even a, a corrupt, porn-addicted car salesman who's been married at that time four times. I have nothing to point to that is a success in any way, shape, or form that would qualify me to talk to anyone about Jesus. 250 million people across the entire globe because I was obedient to open my mouth. I was willing to do what God said. And it, listen, I don't know all of you real well, but I would just say myself, I don't think any of you are as worse of a scumbag than I am. I'm serious. Awful in every way. And if he can use me, right, if he could use me, to share the gospel with 250 million people, the greatest of sinners he can certainly use any one of you. If you'll just bend your knee, he can use you, okay? Infinitely more. Infinitely more, okay? All right. The kingdom of heaven is like yeast changing you. The kingdom of heaven is like the seed that changes yours, your family, your friends, your co-workers, your city, your, in this case, world, okay? Don't, listen, don't ever think that you're in some little church of 75 people, okay? Because the church that did that had half of you in it. Wow. 12. <laughs> 250 million people, okay? This is rocking it right here, okay? Don't think that God can't use you or us to do crazy things to build his kingdom, okay? Maybe the best is yet to come. Maybe 250 million was a foreshadow of what's to come for our church. I don't know. I hope you think that it's just going to get better. Let's move on from that, okay? Let's talk about the cost of the kingdom. Okay, so there's a verse in, uh, 
Hebrews chapter 10. You can go there if you want. You don't need to if you don't want to, but whatever. In Hebrews chapter 10, and it describes an all too common view of Jesus and his kingdom. And this right here, this is the pastor's heart. This is not just this pastor's heart. This is every pastor's heart, whether they want to tell you this or not. I'm telling you, this is the heart of the pastor right here. This is the stuff that drives them crazy, okay? This verse describes a very common view of Jesus and his kingdom. Now, when we're about to read it, you're going to see that it clearly is speaking to those who simply have either completely denied Christ, like they've heard the gospel and they said no to it. I'm stubborn. I don't want to bend my knee. These are non-believers. These are not followers of Christ. These are not disciples of Christ. But listen, if you would mark the box labeled Christian on a census, if that's you, then this verse is absolutely for you as well. Okay? Hebrews chapter 10, verse 29. You know, let, 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 me, let me read 28 first. For anyone who refused to obey the law of Moses was put to death without mercy on the testimony of two or three witnesses. Yikes, right? Just think how much worse the punishment will be for those who have trampled on the Son of God and have treated the blood of the covenant which made us holy as if it were common and unholy and have insulted and disdained the Holy Spirit who brings God's mercy to us. Clearly, there, when we read that, you see the wrath that's coming, the punishment that's coming for those who simply refuse Jesus. But that word common really grabbed a hold of me. When you think about who Jesus is, before I say that, notice what it says. It says the treated as common, which made us holy. He's talking to believers. What made you holy? Was it your actions? It was the blood of Christ, right? So think about this. Loved ones, Christians, that have been made holy. When you think about who Jesus is, when you think about all that he endured on that cross, whipped beaten, spit on, slapped, and killed, and didn't deserve it. And when you think of all that it fixed for you, if what he did on the cross shows how much he values you, then shouldn't your life show how much you value him? Isn't treating something as common like saying... It's no big deal. whoop de doo da They're a dime a dozen. Common. Like it's no biggie. Isn't that the message sent from the believer when nationwide, it doesn't pertain to everybody in this room, but nationwide, the most faithful attenders attend twice a month? Isn't that the message that's sent to God that you're treating it as common? Like, it's no big deal. Listen, when 3% of churchgoers in America completely financially fund the mission of the kingdom, 3% tithe. That means 97% of those that call themselves Christians and would attend church services fairly regular don't give 10% of their income. They give less, if anything. Isn't that the message that sent God, it's no big deal? When 10% of the church, and this is true in every church, no matter how big the size, 10% of the church does 100% of the work of the church. Listen, I know churches of six, eight, a thousand people that still don't have enough teachers for their kids. A thousand people. Think about that. 
a thousand people still shortage of teachers because they won't help. Isn't it sending a message to God that it's common, no big deal, when proven fact, 80% of Christ followers only read their Bible when the preacher puts it on the screen? Is not the strength of the church being stripped away as Christians just say, it's no big deal. It's no big deal. I don't have to do all those things. The value that we should place on the kingdom is what Jesus talks about in Matthew 13. Go back there. Verses 44 through 46. We compare our lives. Now it's time to just look at ourselves. Don't look at anybody else in the room. Don't look at anyone else in your life. You compare the way you treat Jesus and the blood that made you holy. Think about your response to that. And then listen to the words of your Savior in Matthew 13, 44. It's talking about the kingdom again. The kingdom of heaven, verse 44. The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure. A treasure. Think about that. A treasure. What do you see in your mind? Big pirate box, right? A big treasure box filled with gold and all the, 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 the chains of gold and pearls and just pouring out of it. You see that in your mind, right? The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure. What's your greatest treasure? Right? A treasure. If I handed you today that pirate treasure box with millions and millions of dollars worth of gold and diamonds. Would you treat it as common? Would you just leave it wherever? Guard it whenever? Use it whenever? No, just leave it here, man. It's no big deal. It's just common. Or would you say, hey, someone might take that thing, right? What would you be like? Let's be honest, right? Touch it up, yo. Is your phone your treasure? Okay, good. All right, what do we do with our treasure? The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure that a man finds in a field. And when he finds it, he buries it again. In his excitement, he hides it again, he buries it again. What? And then sold everything he owned to get enough money to buy the field. Why, why does he say, why though de the details of the story are interesting. Why, why does he bury it again? Well, if you're going through my backyard, right, and you stumble upon my treasure, you don't get to dig it out and keep it. There's no finders, keepers, losers, weepers on my yard. In Lake County, you do that. What do you hear? <laughs> right? That's my treasure. So what does the guy do? He's not going to take a chance on, this, on losing the treasure. He's not going to take a chance on claiming the treasure and then someone taking it away from him. Oh, no. I'm going to put it back in the ground. I'm going to go back to my house. I'm going to sell everything that I own so I could buy the land just so I can have the treasure. That's how valuable this is. Kingdom of heaven is like a treasure. What about the next story? Would it be the same? Verse 45, again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant on the lookout for choice pearls. That's us too, right? Searching, looking, seeking something in life, always looking for something to make us happy, right? We're like that. I'm, I'm like that. I'm a hedonist. I like to be happy and do stuff that makes me fun. Anybody? Right? We're all like that. We're looking for choice pearls. It's just an illustration of our life. We're always looking. We want a good restaurant, good car, good house, good clothes, good this, good that. We always want that, right? Nothing wrong with that. But watch what happens when he discovers a pearl of great value. 
Not just like the other stuff, but something that's distinctly different, that's way more valuable than all this other stuff. When he discovers the pearl of great value, he, like the other guy, sells everything he owned and bought it. Again, when he finds the pearl, couldn't he have just put it in his pocket and leave? Could have, but there's a chance that someone could have a claim on that thing, and so he didn't want to lose it. So he's going to do whatever it takes to make sure I have that. Because it's the most important thing. They sold everything and bought it. There's lots of good things, right? These pearl, he's looking for pearls, looking for pearls. But there's only one great thing. It's Jesus Christ, the king, and his kingdom. But we think that, it's, that the kingdom... And its king are add-ons, like fit-ins, right? Like, uh, like nooks and crannies on, a, on, a, on Thomas's English muffin. I'll just kind of tuck it in these little spots where I think I need them. I'll just pepper them in. But the problem with that is Jesus himself. He said, when you see the value of the kingdom then you're willing to give up everything to have it. It's not as free as some would teach you that it is. Certainly it's free in that you didn't go to the cross, he did. I didn't go to the cross, he did. But he also teaches us in Luke 14, 33, quote, whoever does not forsake, look away from, I don't need it. Whoever does not forsake all that he has cannot be my disciple. That's costly. And Jesus is unashamed of this. He's not going to chase. If you look at me right now and say, I'm not willing to do that. I'm out of here. I'm not chasing you. And Jesus wouldn't either. He's loving He's full of grace, but he's also full of truth. If you want to be my disciple, you need to be willing to forsake everything else in life to follow me. The rich man said, what do I got to do? You got to follow these commands. You got to sell all that you have and give it to the poor and follow me. The guy's like, I can't do it. Jesus did not chase after him. And I love you. And I don't want anyone to say no to Jesus. But I'd rather have the bar high so that you know you're saved, than for, for me to lower the bar so you think you are. Shame on me. I'm not doing that. So I, I, if, if one or two of you walked out of here today and said, I'm not willing to do that, listen, I love you. I'll pray for you. I don't want that for you. But those that would stay, I want you to understand something. If you want to be a disciple of Christ, all this other stuff that you've got going on in your life, it needs to go away. It really needs to go away. This is the frustration of the preachers who have done what they can to inspire you and provoke you to get you going so you'd be this, but you're not. People are not like this. And what frightens the pastor is that Matthew 7 says, many are going to come to me in the end and say, Lord, Lord, I did this, I did this. He's going to go, who are you? Why do you call? And Luke, he says, why do you call me Lord when you will not do what I say? It's costly. So what practical God do you have in your life that's somehow trumping the real God? Who or what gets more of your resource than Jesus? Who gets more of your Time, that's a resource, isn't it? You only got 24 hours in a day. That's a resource. Guess what, though? You didn't create days. He did. So if you got a day today, that's a gift from God. So who's going to get most of that 24 hours today? See that? Let's, just, let's just reduce it down to the nuts and bolts. Who's going to get more of your time, money, attention, and service today Jesus or something else? 
that's just right one day at a time. What's going to get your what's going to get your resources today? Because every single thing that you have, why would you say that you haven't earned it, right? And why would you say you've earned it when it's been given to you, right? So if he's given it to you, what are you going to do with all that stuff today? Do you spend more time reading fictional novels or time on social media than you do in the Bible? The Bible says we're supposed to study it continuously so that you would obey all that it says. Do you ever wonder why you don't obey what it says? Because you don't know it. Whoever said that over there. The psalmist says that we're supposed to meditate on God's word day and night. How many people are doing that? Not even me. I don't, I don't let the microphone fool you. I'm not. But this goes on to say that those that will are like a tree. There it is again, right? You want to be that life-giving tree? Here's how you can be a life-giving tree. To be a life-giving tree, you have to have some fruit, right? You've got to have some nesting area for the birds, right? You have something to give the people who would come to your tree to take up residence there, right? Those who meditate on God's word day and night are like a tree planted by the edge of the river, sucking in nutrients all the time, right? They're not in a drought area. They're in a wet area, right? And they bear fruit in every season, it says, and their, their, their leaves never wither. They're always life-giving. Who are these people that do that? Those who meditate on his word day and night. You want to be a life-giving spirit to the people around you? Meditating on his word day and night. How often are you, how much time are you spending memorizing God's word? So that when the junk comes your way like it did to Jesus in the wilderness, what did he do? He quoted the Bible at Satan. Right. If you ever wonder if that Bible that you towed around has any power, Jesus quoted it, not at a demon, not a legion of demons. He quoted it at the devil himself, and it made the devil split town. So you think it's not powerful? You think maybe you should spend a little bit more time in it? Maybe a little more victory in your life, a little more power in your life, maybe a little more life-giving to other people. If you'd spend more time in God's word, what it can do inside of you to give you life so you can give life to others. Do you spend more time in politics than prayer? Ready for the pain? Do you spend more money on your car payment than your tithes and offerings? Do you spend more time watching sports than you do in worship gatherings? Please don't take this as condemning. When you're a preacher, your heart's desire is that the people that you are given to, uh, to, to look over, to, to oversee, entrusted to you for your care. You so desperately want the kingdom of God to grow inside of them in these ways, but you see all the things that distract them from it. And you're like, you have these visions of what God could do in and through you and your church. And you, and you see the people, like I think about you guys, I see your faces, and I see what could happen. And just in honesty, right? Week after week after month after month, year after year, all the stuff on that list never makes the priority list. And it's still football, and it's still this, and it's still car payments, and it's still cable. And, still, and you just like, you just want to reach down and you just want to grab hold of everybody and go, oh, you just get it, please. <laughs> right? Because you know in your heart, you know that this that this is true and it's powerful, and you know what God could do. Like, look what one dude, 250 million people, right? If he could do that through one person who is just obedient, what would he do through all of us if we made his kingdom the number one priority of our life? 
I, I, listen, I don't even know what he would do because we haven't done it yet. So I can't look back to a greater day and say, hey, listen, it would be just like this if you would do that. I can't because yet, since 2010, I've never, we, I, we've had altar calls. We've had raise your hand. We've had servolution where everyone's like, we're going to do it, we're going to do it, we do it. We still don't do it. We still don't do it, right? We still don't do it. So I'm just, I'm just here I am again, afresh, right? One more, one more round, Rocky, right? Get back in there, Mickey says. Go in there and fight. So here I am again in the ring, punching, swinging, and saying, guys, Jesus said to be my disciple, you have to be willing to forsake all things and make him and his kingdom the priority of your life. So we look at people in the Bible, we look at them and like, oh, that's amazing, right? Guys like Paul in Philippians 3, 7, he said this, and then we're done. Whatever was an asset to me, Paul, learned, he had education, he had power, prestige, he had the letters from the authorities, he was, he was powerful man of God. And, and, and he had, he had the, the authority of the Jewish leadership. Like, this guy was a, he was an important dude. He was a Jew of Jews, he kept the law perfect, power, prestige. He said, whatever was an asset to me, whatever it is, and, and what is it for you? What, what is it to you that's so important? Just think about those things that are important to you. Whatever was an asset to me, I count it as loss for the sake of Christ. And Moses, who lived way, 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 way back, but referenced here in the New Testament, Hebrews chapter 11, verse 26. You know, Moses, he grew up in the Pharaoh's palace, you know. He was a Jewish kid that never really should have been in the palace. He was a Jewish guy. Just a peasant level. But he ends up in the palace in Egypt. And Egypt was the most powerful nation in the world. That all the riches and power, the king, the pharaoh, you know, all that. Palaces and gold and fancy food, fancy clothing, education, power. You know, you look at some guy, kill that guy. No problem. Dead. That's, this, is who he, this is what he could have had. And Hebrews 11.26 says that Moses valued disgrace for Christ. Like, I'm willing to do what Jesus wants above the treasures of Egypt. Think of what he forsakes to be obedient to Jesus and building his kingdom. This is why. The end of the verse. Why was he willing to forsake the treasures of Egypt? For he was looking ahead to his reward. He was looking ahead to the kingdom of heaven. And he knew that that was more important, more valuable than any riches of this world. Any luxury, any comfort, any money, any power, Anything, I forsake it all because I look forward to my reward in the kingdom of heaven. God, where we are not like Paul, where we are not like Moses, Lord, if you've given me this privilege to, to shepherd these people, my heartfelt request, I plead, is that we would once and for all become like Paul, become like Moses of old, and consider all the things that we thought an asset in this life as loss to know you to serve you. Knowing that our reward is not here in this world, but in the kingdom of heaven where we will be with you forever. Where there's no more sorrow, 
No more tears, no more fear, no more sickness, no more death. Well, we don't get to sing our favorite songs. We get to sing your favorite song. Lord, how sweet it will be when we gather around the throne for all eternity and sing your favorite song. How awesome that chorus will be. <clears throat> Prepare us for that, Lord. And help us to lay aside all the distractions of this world. And I mean now, Lord, I'm talking about you being the yeast right now. And you begin to permeate every facet of our lives right now. Big change. Big change, Lord. Big change. Let today be, be, be the, the turning point in this church where these people no longer are distracted by the things of this world, but that your kingdom and our king, you, Lord Jesus, is the most important thing to us. And we give you our very best and our most all the time. Let it be different now, Lord. Let the old be gone. Let the new be birthed today here in this church. In Jesus' name. Now, Lord, as we take this and we display a new person, let our church no longer be a church of lack, but a church of abundance, a church of generosity. Help us to look after one another so that nobody fails to, re to, to receive the grace of God. That's why you strongly encourage us to generously give, to earnestly serve all the time. So we're going to do that right now. We are going to, we are going to give. We're going to sacrifice. We're going to be generous to advance your kingdom. We don't talk about it anymore, Lord. We do it. We don't just hear the word of the Lord. We do it lest we be deceived. So, Lord, I pray that right now as we just get quiet before you for a few moments and give you the space that you totally deserve to speak to the heart of every single person in this room and speak to them about kingdom giving, to build your kingdom, to make it the most important part of their life. What does that look like for each individual? Because it's not the same, Lord, and we understand that. It may be a dollar to some, it might be a million to another. You tell us what we should do, and we'll do it. So Holy Spirit, just speak to your people now.